Hello, puppies and kittens. Uh, we are having a uh, just a casual conversation today about talking about primates. We have somebody who's studying primatology who wanted to uh, to go about that. And I, while I like to take the opportunity to talk to people to disagree with me, I don't like to be in an echo chamber. At the same time, I love to talk to people who actually are, are doing science. So, Erica, nice to meet you. So, what 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 would you like to discuss about primatology? Oh man, I mean, I that's that's a <laughs> that's a dangerous question to ask. <laughs> I well, my my research, as it were, um, if I can indeed make it happen here in the next couple of months, which I'm not sure uh, if, if if that's going to work, but my um, my goal, at least once that can kind of come to fruition, is I'm studying uh, sexually dimorphic behavior in pig-tailed macaques uh, over in Malaysia, so in peninsular Malaysia. Um, and I I would love to pick your brain on sort of uh, and and talk myself, just have a fun conversation about sort of the theory of mind with regard to primates and human evolution. You know, um, how we kind of get our social organization and and how we sort of have our our um, the you know kind of the evolution of altruism versus spiteful behavior, uh, sort of the big categorical four of the foundational you know social social processes and mechanisms. Um, but mostly, I just want to talk about about primates and and human evolution and anthropology because I know you're kind of taking uh, those courses as of right now. And God, the last time I took uh, a course in human evolution was in 2016, so it's been quite some time. And and I I'm not nearly as up to date on the literature with with human evolution as I am with uh, with kind of extant primates. Um, and I know you just spent some time in the Karoo as well, which is really, really cool. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm currently back in the States, unfortunately, um, writing out this pandemic. Um, I've been living for the past six months in the UK, uh, going to school there to, for my master's of research in primatology. Um, I've got to where meet- were you, Where were you? Were you in Manchester or London? No, South London. Yeah. South London. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About, um, about a 20 minute tube ride from Tower Hill. So not not too far out there. Uh, my university is Roehampton, and um, them and Oxford Brooks are kind of your two primatology guys if you're looking to specialize in in research on extant uh, extant animals. And I got to work under some really cool people. My um, my supervisor, her supervisor was Robin Dunbar. So he was the guy who came up with like the social brain hypothesis and uh, and things of of that nature. So. That's kind of the route that I'm that I'm taking. I have some colleagues who are working with like communication. Um, Stuart Simple is is one of the faculty members there, and he was a part of that paper. Um, I can send it to you if you want. Be, you might have actually already read it, but it's really cool. It's on uh, gelata baboon vocalizations. I have not read that. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't have. To, if I wasn't taking classes in it where there was required reading, I wouldn't be able to make time to read. That's, that's oh my god. Thing. I'm glad that I'm taking. I'm glad that I'm taking classes again because I'm back on the learning curve where I would prefer right. to be. Uh, because sometimes it, it, getting into what is effectively my job now. Uh, I spend more time pretending to be learned than actually yeah. learning, and I would, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I would rather remain on that curve, like indefinitely. Yeah, you know, you know what though? I think that's almost a little bit of, uh, of like the um, imposter syndrome or whatever, because I've I've heard you talk on on phylogeny. And you really know what you're talking about, at least from an outsider's perspective. God, I wish I I wish I could remember um, uh, sort of. All the classifications as well as you can, but once we once you get outside of the primate order, I'm I'm hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it, I I have seen a number of things just in the last few because of the classes that I'm taking. I've been finding out information that I know nobody knew when I went to college the first time. You know, I'm 57 years old. I have made other attempts at college, unfortunately, as a as an art major because I was an idiot, but. <laughs> I, I'm, <laughs> passionate. Yeah, when I was young, good-looking, and stupid, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I went to college as an art major. But I also took an evolution class. I did have an interest in science even even then, but they they hardly knew anything then. As a matter of fact, yeah. they were they were just when I the first, when I took a, an evolution class the first time, they were just positing the notion that uh, um, Protista might be more than one kingdom. Oh my God. Yeah, <laughs> and they, they were just like positing the idea that hey, maybe there's this domain thing we're going to add to. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! The studies that I'm seeing now, I mean, everything has been done like in the last five years or ten years at most. 
So. Oh, well, and I mean, that's the thing with, with anthropology too. I mean, that's, that's why when, you know, I kind of d jumped at this, this opportunity because it's like, you know, so much has changed just since I took it and I took it, what, four years ago. Um, and, and here we've got all of a sudden, all of these cool hybridization events occurring in, in sort of the, 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 our, my anthropo or my bio -amp teacher called it like the middle earth where you have like five primary hominids all living at the same time or hominids living at the same time. Um, and you've got Denisovans with Neanderthalensis and then you've got Sapiens with Neanderthalensis and, and you just, all of these interesting mixes. And when I took it, I think, I think we knew that there was probably Neanderthal human or Sapiens uh, hybridization, but golly, it's just overnight. We, you know, the second you pull these things out of the dirt, it's, it's crazy. In a span of, I think it was a little bit more than five years, but but it, in that relatively brief span, you're, you're right. I mean, there was suddenly there was Denisovans, which it's it's amazing that they they don't they knew this thing by the fossil of a single finger bone. Right, right. right. Just what and and where was it? You know, like like off in Siberia or something. Yeah. And because they're able to get DNA out of it, which was extraordinary for people who don't, uh, for people will argue, DNA lasts for maybe fifty thousand years when you can get it. So that's the so no, they didn't find any DNA in dinosaurs. No. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that, so they find DNA in this one finger bone, and the weird thing is, is that they find traces of the genome, like in a ghost lineage. Right. In a population of Melanesian people. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. So, so the finger bone was in Siberia, but the genome is is still surviving in Melanesian. So that that implies a huge range for which there's no fossil evidence other than the Siberian bone. I mean, there's nothing in the interim. There's nothing to cover what. There's a vast range of territory that we know that they had to have existed in. Why does their genome not exist? in all these other human deans, right? Why is it only Mel Melanesians? That's that's kind of interesting. It's you know? it's it's insanely interesting. And I know, um, I think it was a couple of months ago they found, or, or at least it's being attributed to currently, uh, a jawbone that was probably Denisovans as well. Um, and I was I saw that and I was like, oh my God, now we have two pieces. <laughs> <laughs> two full pieces <laughs> and, and yeah. I you know I was over the moon about it and you know it's it's like only only an anthropology um but yeah I, I I find it insane you know how quickly you know and and this is the classic I know you know this is beating a dead horse for you but this is like the classic thing with um that uh particularly creationists like to get upset about is that it's like science is constantly changing and you know pop science is very guilty of being like oh this new find completely changes human evolution when in reality it's like it it moves a couple of dates around but but the general trends are are have, if have that changed. yeah yeah if, if that probably and, and here's this is gonna be a strange revelation the most dramatic find that has been made in the last, well, it's actually been more than 10 years now. In the last 15 years, the most dramatic find, Homo floresiensis. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I watched a presentation, uh, I think it was a TED talk or some kind of thing. It, it, it was some, no, it wasn't, it was a lecture. It was a full on lecture and questioning the legitimacy of that find. Oh, my but God. it's by a paleoanthropologist giving that lecture. Right. And it's it was very objectively presented, and I have to sit back and wonder, hmm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you're just like, man, this is uh, that's that's rough. I um, <laughs> when, when I first heard about Homo floresiensis, I was under the impression that there was like nine individuals found, but in fact, there's only one skeleton. Right. So while you may have fragments attributed to, to nine individuals, you have only one actual physical form. And that causes a huge question, a whole bunch of questions that can only be answered by finding another form. To find, in, in the, and and um, to find anything else on Flores will be remarkably rare because it was, is and was tropical. And so tropical jungle regions are notoriously bad for leaving fossils. And they don't lend themselves to preservation at all. Exactly. So, what what are your chances you're going to find anything? Uh, it it will it will support that there was, and and the dates were also confused. Originally, they dated this thing as like thirteen thousand years, which was stunning because that just that did that was outside of everybody's window. But then they reevaluated the geology on this and realized that it's actually closer to sixty or seventy thousand years. Right. So that, right. That's significant. So, if at the very minimum. 
it's going to be a species of human. That's definitely human, you know, it, whether it has uh, these, it's like, it like has a, a wrist bone that is only ex that only exists in Australopithecus, and shapes of some bones that that are, are more consistent with uh, uh, with other apes, like more basal apes, but still obviously human. So was this something that was a stem off of off of Homo erectus, or did it did it branch off earlier? Does this represent an even earlier migration? Right. So it's going to be significant, whatever it turns out to be, but it may not be quite what we've envisioned it to be. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think part of the, you, you really nailed the, hit the nail on the head with you know, a single specimen, particularly with primates, because sexual dimorphism is always you know, up in the air. I mean, here you have the artipiths where, where it's expected that we have very little sexual dimorphism at all. And then very soon after, you know, in geologic time speaking, you've got the australopiths where, where sexual dimorphism is, is usually at play. Um, they, I know very recently um, there was kind of a, you know, recently is just kind of a relative term in the past decade, but with Aegyptopithecus in the Fayu, um, kind of the old world monkey, one of our, our early, I think it's an oligopithecid, but I'm not positive. Um, but yeah, they, they, they came out and they were like, yeah, you know, we have these two different species of Aegyptopithecus living out here and it's really neat. Um, and, and they're vastly different in, in sort of their robustness. And then uh, a primatologist, is, you know, specializing in in, in canine teeth, came out and was like, mm, "I think you might have a male and a female here. You know, I think this is a single species, and that's what we're dealing with." Um, when you're studying so cool. it does kind of throw a wrench in in our concepts of paleontology because absolutely, uh, there was one of the things that I used as a visual source for a lot of the videos that I work in, like fossil works and or no, not fossil works. I'm sorry, what was it? Uh, um, there was it was a website that sells casts of bones, and so bones, like yeah, bones, skull maybe. something. But anyway, it, it was, it was, there's two different websites that sell these these casts of bones, and so they get, they give all these little images so that you can look and compare uh, the skulls of a Boston Terrier and a Great Dane and a Chihuahua and and all and and the diversity among domesticated dogs is through the roof. There's just an incredible amount of diversity just in that group. Now between groups like, you know, like, like high and Pictus or the African Cape wild dog or, or the bush dog or raccoon dog, you, know, you look at all of these other species of dogs and their skulls are very similar, but within this one species, you suddenly have an explosion, this huge proliferation where they're in fact all genetically interfertile, technically all the same species, despite their, their bizarre variety visually you know and, and if it's down at the skull level you know, that's more significant usually we we see change and i have to i'm not talking to you i'm talking to the audience <laughs> usually usually uh changes happen at the surface level first and kind of sink in over time so that you know you begin to see changes deeper down later on but with what with but domestic dogs we have this bizarre range where if, if you found these skulls in situ as fossils they would absolutely be categorized as different species, hands down, because there's no way to know that they're chemically interfertile. But then I don't think we've ever attacked anything as, as far as artificial um, selection like we have with dogs. And that's why we've made, they, made them so pathetic. Oh, I know. Yeah, my <laughs> <laughs> I was in... Um... Uh, I was uh, my, my undergraduate major was animal science, so kind of the veterinary school track. And I had a lot of friends who were, um, you know, professionals at getting people to completely swear off of pugs and, you know, French bulldogs, anything with those brachycephalic skulls, just because you see, once you see the skull too, you're like, oh, this is, we might be dealing with an abomination. Here. <laughs> 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 so, you you know, it's, it's, it's what an adorable <laughs> little abomination you are. <laughs> <laughs> how they can't breathe. <laughs> I love how they snuffle. It's like, it's gasping for breath. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I I think you're right, and you know I I actually it was kind of a, a aha moment for me, but I was reading a paper uh, early last year I believe uh, that was talking about the difference between divergence times and speciation times, and all of a sudden it kind of clicked for me, and I was like, holy cow, because the paper was talking about how uh, the last common ancestor between humans and genus Pan, um, maybe say Helanthropus, but we're not really sure. I I don't know how what what they're saying now, but they when I took it, it was like it's maybe say Helanthropus, but Say Lanthropus also has derived canines, so maybe not. Um, and so uh, they were like, yeah, it's 
it's more likely than not that the the sort of lineages that stemmed off from this common ancestor into Pan and what would become Homo could interbreed for like four ish million years, three point five four ish million years. Um, and all of a sudden, I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, that that actually is insane and, and kind of lends itself to, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, especially with primate societies, right, and how they interact, how this would kind of be at play. Um, but I think that also with what we see in, in sort of chimps and, and gorillas or chimps and bonobos that occupy sort of similar habitats, they seem to be pretty good at not mixing themselves up, you know? So I, I don't know that we would see it as often as kind of it was proposed in the paper. But it still blew my mind, and it's kind of what you were saying with 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 the canids, right? It's like, or with our like all of our domestic dogs. Who knows what what some of these hybrids would look like, and the, and yet they would still be kind of within the same gene pool. Realistically, if we were to find something in the fossil record that was that diverse, they would not have been. You know, they certainly wouldn't have been artificially selected to be that. You know, they they wouldn't. You wouldn't have all this variety appearing in a, in a span of what four hundred years. Right. Yeah. That wouldn't happen. So it would be it would be safe to call those things different species using the, the the species concept that they use for other organisms that maybe are not sexually reproductive even, you know, where it's based on character traits rather than, you know, reproductivity. But it's it still it still throws that wrench in there. Like what I what I love is when they you, you I'm talking I'm I'm arguing with people who who are completely accepting that all of these wildly diverse dog skulls belong to the same species. <laughs> but, yeah. but then when you show Australopith and, and early human, it's, and somehow these are some different. My, and, and, and they will both accept and reject, depending on who you're talking to, uh, Homo erectus. That's just an ape or it's just a human. And they overlap on which one it is. I'm, I'm in an email conversation with two different creationists right now. Two com th th as far as I know, they're not in contact with one another. One is is currently arguing that uh, Afarensis is belongs to the to the human kind, and the other is arguing that Afarensis belongs to the ape kind, and and I'm sitting here and I'm like, you you guys don't understand. Like, I can understand the the very fact that you're both arguing for the opposite lends itself to the mosaic nature of of the species. Isn't that the definition of what a transitional species <laughs> is? It's, that's exactly it. And that's why you can't ask them to give you uh, an example of what a perfect transition would look like because it would be aphorensis. Or well, I, I actually I actually made the statement in one of my videos that the best way to determine whether something is transitional is when creationists can't agree which side of this line it's 100% on. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you say that, but I actually think that that, that that kind of holds water, you know, because I've, I've been, you know, going around saying that uh, uh, Africanus and Afarensis really, I mean, you really couldn't ask, Darwin couldn't ask for a better representation of a transitional form. And, um, and, and that really is kind of underscored by the fact that you've got the Ken Hams and the Kent Hovens disagreeing, and then your Ray Comforts are going back and forth, <laughs> depending on <laughs> which way the wind is blowing this decade. <laughs> yeah, which one pays more, I think, would for, for Ray Comforts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so tell me about uh, your your current experience with with taking courses in anthropology. Do you think you're going to want to um, kind of go down that route or more general paleontology? I don't do a lot with with anthropology, as far as strangely, you would think, with the, the classifications and, and the, the work that I normally am am most interested in doesn't really focus on anthropology as much as I think a lot of people would suspect, but. I mean, obviously, we are talking about human evolution. We're talking about where the the, the blend of where paleontology uh, begins to become confused with archaeology is where a lot of this uh, the whole controversy comes up with in, in my, all my arguments. So I, I have to take courses in archaeology, you know, a handful or several of them, and pseudo archaeology. That's a course I'm taking right now too. That was a laugh. Oh wow! So to so even offer a class in pseudo archaeology because you have to because there is so much deliberately deceptive misinformation being promulgated. Um, things like, uh, I love this one. Uh, th there's a handful of creationists who give themselves PhDs. I'm aware. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware. <laughs> yeah there's like mail order catalogs or correspondence uh, courses or whatever, where they can just like order out and get one. And in, in one case, a, a guy just created a mythical school that never existed, declared himself to be the dean of that school, gave himself, 
the PhD of that school and forgot to log any paperwork that would give him the ability to give himself a PhD. So even if the school actually existed, it still wouldn't have sufficient accreditation, even as a diploma mill, for him to give himself a PhD. But he did anyway. So it's all completely made up because all of this creationism is based completely on lies. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, 100%. I mean, especially too, when you get it, you know, I, I, I think it becomes most evident when you get into like the, the career creationists as well. Like your Tom Kins, your Gene Sin, um, the, the, especially, or like the, you know, the guys that come out of uh, uh, Answers in Genesis. Um, and it's always interesting to me that they never have any, they, they don't have a single anthropologist in, mm -hmm. in their ranks. Um, and very few biologists that are actually in, in general mainline biology. They all tend to be like geneticists, you know, with kind of a little asterisk there, which is exactly why they're so strained for, for you know, categorical experts that they get Georgia Purdom up there talking about flood geology, you know, and, and it's like, what was Snelling busy this week? Like, <laughs> Could you not get the main guy up there to be talking about this? Um, yeah, boy, Snelling is Snelling is is one of the most annoying of their entire crew. Mm. Um, but but I did a comparison where I found an article that he had written about uh, Acanthostega, and then there was another guy I can't remember his name right now that was also writing for Answers in Genesis. He also wrote about Acanthostega, and much like your two guys who can't agree on whether. Africanus is in the human kind or in the ape kind, right? Well, these guys wrote completely opposite declarations of Acanthostega, both dismissing. Again, Acanthostega is another perfect example of a transitional species. So one of them says that it can't be transitional because the legs are entirely suited for swimming or incapable of supporting the body out of water. The legs are just, are just fins and that's all. And the other one, writes that it can't be transitional because it has fully developed legs that it can walk around on that wouldn't be useful for swimming. <laughs> so I, I just clipped, okay, I'm reading two different articles articles at different times, but I, I remember, oh wait, I remember this other guy saying exactly the opposite. Go find that, clip them together, take their pictures, show the thing, and now I've got a side-by-side -side comparison to show what bullshittery these people are up to. It's, it really, it's incredible. You see, see, you see the same thing with, um, with Archaeopteryx as well, with the, the Jeff Meldrums of, of the world get out there and, and start talking about how Archaeopteryx, you know, those aren't, either they go with the whole, it's a total bird, or they go with the, those aren't feathers, it's just collagen. And then it's like, well, that's cool, because there's a paper last year that, that told us what pigment they were. <laughs> like, Well, there's a couple of guys that went even further than that. Uh, one of them is Fred Hoyle, who famously uh, he, he he denigrated the whole Big Bang thing, and he 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 came up with the tornado in the junkyard analogy. Yeah. But oddly enough, he, he's not your standard creationist, but he did, as a professional scientist and a self-declared atheist, though technically not really atheist. If you if you read his stuff, he, he, this guy's it's he's in a weird category. He argues for constant creation events that new hydrogen atoms are being miraculously created continuously. And, and he argues for an intelligent designer. The hell is that? How is that not a creationist? Okay, so he says he doesn't believe in a God. And then he describes this God that he believes in. But one of his arguments, I, I believe it was him, that was arguing against Archaeopteryx, that Archaeopteryx was a hoax. Mm, mm. That they had taken, and he wasn't the only person to say this, that they, that they had taken the skeleton of a compsonathus and glued feathers to it. Now, you've seen probably all six fossils of, of Archaeopteryx lithographica. They're all lithographic fossils, wherein you have the, you have the mostly complete animal like com, uh, com compressed into, a, into a, like a plate impression. So yeah. that when you get the fossil, you're not getting individual bones and trying to piece them together. They're, they're still articulated in whatever position they were in when the thing was buried. And then like it was a lithographic fossil made of it. And you just cut that bit out of the rock. And now we've got the whole skeleton. There's like six fossils that are like that. Right. Obviously you can't glue a feather onto an impression. <laughs> that, <laughs> I, 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 that's what I was like thinking. Gluing another toe print onto a footprint. That that makes no sense. I mean, if any, yeah, if anything, you're going to have to go the route that it was what carved carved in there. You know, um, very but meticulous. The argument that he has that if the feathers are a fraudulent attachment to a, um, a compsodathus, that is a full on admission that we're dealing with a with a dinosaur 
not a bird. Well, absolutely. And the thing is, too, about that is that the feathers aren't the only thing that that is is kind of your calling card for a transitional in Archaeopteryx. You know, I mean, you've got like the semi semilunate carpal, sort of the orientation of the pelvis. I, I believe the the hind limbs have something to do with it. It's been quite some time. The teeth on on what is otherwise a very avian looking skull. Um, that, that blows my mind. Ugh. Are you familiar with band, B-A-N-D? No. That is an organization of scientists, of which only one of them, I think, uh, Fiducia, was an, was an actual, like, creationist. But I know a, Fiducia, Alan Fiducia, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Th this was a group of guys who decided in the 80s that they were going to, future tense, they've all made this pact that they are going to deny all the evidence that ever arises to, to, to imply that birds descend from dinosaurs. They made a pact to do that in the 1980s and have tried to live up to it ever since. I, so, yeah, I know Fiducia is still the one going, really going at it. Um, is, is Fiducia officially a creationist? I could have sworn he was like the last kind of strand of quote unquote conventional science, right? That That's still holding on to that. Or yeah, I, it probably wouldn't be fair to call him a, cre a creationist. He's the only one that seems to have a religious motivation. Right. Okay. That, yeah. yeah there, the, there the, the other one, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the, there was another guy's name that there's, all, there's two names. If every time, absolutely every time in the 2000s that you ever found an article that implied that the birds are not dinosaurs always ever every single time there was going to be with this name or fiducia yeah yeah fiducia fiducia is always at it with that and he i i, I the reason i think that he's a sort of conventional scientist the, with re, with religious motivations is just because i remember i had a conversation with the young earth creationist um old co-worker of mine who was like name dropping fiducia and he was like see conventional science agrees with me and i'm like Okay, so <laughs> you got this one kind of backwoods hack, right, who's agreeing with you amongst the legions of paleontologists who, upon finding fossil after fossil of like Bapisaurus or Caudipteryx with just like these gorgeous feathers, some of which preserve pigment, and and you're you're really gonna you're really gonna still name drop Fiducia, who's probably got like some early onset thing going on. I mean, it's and the other one I want to say his name is Ruben. It probably is. Ruben. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, but, but the, 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 the very idea that they made a pact that they're going to deny ever, all the evidence that is ever found before it is found. That's the, the very thing that makes creationism wholly dishonest. Right. Because they too, they, they make their statement of faith that they will never accept any evidence that they're wrong. That's, I don't know how you can get more dishonest than that. Yeah. And it's why they won't define information for the most part, and they won't define a, a transitional fossil for the most part. I mean, you get kind of the outliers who will, but then the other ones don't agree with them on, on that sort of definition. I They're got one of those. I, I got one of those out, outliers and I, I pinned him to a wall on this. And I, okay. You've got a, you've got a website wherein you're, you're announcing what this is. You agree with the actual scientists about what a transitional species is. We can quibble about a couple of the details about his trans, his uh, interpretation, but it, the, his definition is essentially correct. And here is a list of 400 species that exactly fit the definition you've just given. And you're sitting here on your website saying that no one has ever found one. You know that there are actually 400 that meet that definition. So are you going to correct this egregious mistake on your website? The answer is always no. <laughs> or well, the, yeah, he, he responded to me. He said that something along the lines of, I see your point, but admitting that transitional species exists means admitting that evolution is possible. Oh God. So in other words, just, just lie. Yeah. yeah and, and that's the point too. That's the point where you're like, I, I, I've been, I'm kind of new into, in sort of the, um, uh, more public debunking of creationism and things like that uh, community, but I'm having a really hard time kind of parsing out. And, and I say hard time because I try to give people the benefit of the doubt for like honest engagement. Like, is this someone who genuinely wants to know more um, and is curious about you know, the representation in the fossil record of a given species or transition or gradient, whatever? Um, or are we dealing with a bad faith actor? Um, and I've been really burned on that a lot where you put a lot of time into this and then all of a sudden it comes out into well i'm you can present me exactly what i asked for and it doesn't matter um, yeah i've gotten open admissions that, that i'm never going to change my mind 
doesn't matter if this is true, I'm not going to believe it. Right. Yeah. My, my favorite one of these admissions ever of all time was a woman who told me that if she had a time, and I, I gave her this thing, you know, let's say you have a TARDIS, right? With like Doctor Who, you got a time, time machine, you can go back and you can, and let's say you can find Jesus, which I don't think anybody could ever do. <laughs> You could have a time machine and speak Aramaic and you're not going to find his ass. But <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're really where's Waldoing it now. Yeah. So uh, I think that, and, and I don't, before anybody brings up the whole mythicism thing, my myth is, I, I have to, to call myself a mythicist, but for very different reasons than other mythicists do. Yeah. Sure. I think, I think that Jesus is more in the category of Robin Hood and King Arthur uh, mm. at, at, at the at best, he's only as real as Dracula. <laughs> so, so you, when you say as real as Dracula, you mean like a like a, a supernatural power rooted in a, a modern disease? <laughs> well, what I mean is that Vlad Tepes, Vlad the Impaler, actually existed, and unlike yeah. Robin Hood and King Arthur, we actually know that Dracula existed. Yeah, Different we don't name. actually know whether. Robin Hood or King Arthur were ever real. Right. They're commonly accepted by everybody. I mean, ask any Brit ever. And they're, of course, going to readily admit that Robin Hood and King Arthur are absolute characters of history. Nobody questions that. If you question the existence of Robin Hood or King Arthur, well, then you've lost all credibility because you were going against the scientific consensus. You might be able to get them to admit it if you get a couple of pints in them, though. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the fact that nobody can pin down what year or what place or the, right. the only thing that they can verify, for example, about, and this is more than they can do for King Arthur. They can't verify shit about King Arthur. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Not what year, what, 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 what province he was in. Nothing. They can verify absolutely nothing about King Arthur. But the one thing they can verify, the only thing they can verify about Robin Hood is that there's this guy called John Little who had 17 kids in Nottingham. And so, that's the one thing. That's the the sole detail. We don't even get confirmation of the tights. <laughs> well, what, another thing that we had that we know is that Maid Marian, yeah, does not appear in anything until three or four centuries later, oh, wow. where suddenly that character is introduced and and, and continues for uh, forever after that. She becomes a staple immediately. So what that means is, if you were to go back in time and find Robin Hood, which I don't think you could do for the same reason I don't think you can find Jesus, if you could find Robin Hood, bring him forward and have him watch Kevin Costner's version of him. <laughs> or any of them, really. I mean, Errol Flynn. You could, you could have him every version of Robin Hood ever made. He would not recognize himself as the character in that movie. It could Because two things. None of the things that we remember happening to this guy actually happened to that guy. Robin of Loxley, if there was such a person, would be sitting in the theater with you telling me, who the fuck is Maid Marian? I never <laughs> heard of that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and more so, this is also important, the things that he actually did for which he would be outraged to find out that nobody remembers, nobody remembers. <laughs> So, what, but don't you remember when I didn't? No, the fuck, nobody wrote that in the story. They're absolutely turning in his grave at the the cartoon Disney adaption. <laughs> oh, oh, that I always hated that. Man, I I hated that from day one, and not just because I'm an Anglophile. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am an Anglophile. I've always loved British culture. I mean, in British yeah. music, British movies, TV, and everything. Yeah. yeah. So when they did the Disney version of Robin Hood. And for whatever reason, everybody's got a Tennessee accent. <laughs> why? Why is everybody an American country music singer? What the yeah. hell is that? About? <laughs> yeah. And, and it, in one of them, it, 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 they're, they're playing this, the, these songs and everything. And one of the characters actually says, "Lay that country on me, babe." Yeah. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Yeah, that that one uh, that that falls under the egregious category for. Yeah, and and Disney does that a lot. We should we should avoid any further discussion of that because we'll go into Pocahontas and then I'll just get on. Oh uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. A, a tirade of injustice there. I wanted to bring up when I mentioned when I mentioned the 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 guys who give themselves doctorate degrees. Right. 
there was a guy who didn't call himself a doctor. And he, he admitted to being a complete amateur archaeologist, but he found Noah's Ark. No, oh, I, you know what? I think I remember this one. I, mm, was, wait, when, when did this occur? I don't remember the the when, except uh, I think it was late late eighties, maybe. Okay, yeah. And uh, but but the thing I know the where it's called the Drupinar site, right? And so it's on Mount Ararat in Turkey, right where you'd expect it to be. So there is a formation of dirt that, that looks roughly like, but yeah, I know this. Yeah, one. it's roughly canoe shaped because it snows there and snow melt goes around either side of it and has formed this thing into a bait, you know vague canoe shape. And I've seen pictures of that area where there is another similar canoe-shaped thing where you can you can get the two in the same picture if you back up far enough. <laughs> but of course, they don't usually show you that picture because they can't explain why is there a second boat there. <laughs> it, it, it actually it actually blows my mind sometimes the extent to which like how how blatant the the dishonesty can be i i was watching a video uh for for like a kind of systematic deconstruction uh video of, uh, by genesis apologetics and they're talking about the great apes and um the guy on the screen's bitching about how all the reconstructions of lucy have white sclera um and he's like i think this is an attempt to make them look more human and you know like just complaining about that and i was like he's like well, no great apes have you know white sclera and i was like now wait <laughs> Wait just a second. Get on Google. White sclera primates, and you just have an entire series of Google image pages with gorillas, orangs, and members of genus Pan sporting these gorgeous white sclera because it's selected for in nature for gaze following. You know, I mean, it's 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 part of being social. That's why we that's why we're seeing it actually increase according to one paper. And I was like, can you not? Can these guys not take like six seconds to put something into Google? It's right there. Um, well, and that's when you get into the hmm territory. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so this guy, Ron Wyatt, who doesn't exist anymore, and that's unfortunate, uh, uh, not because of any humanitarian concern for human life or anything, but just because I would come after him. <laughs> I, <laughs> you can't get it anymore. He's out of <laughs> I would have loved to have, to have chewed on that leather for a bit. Oh, but uh, this guy, Ron Wyatt, not only found Noah's Ark, knowing that there's a second boat, up mm. there and he's just not going to tell you that part right but he, he then declares that he has found the rivets that went into noah's ark as well because rivets didn't exist in the yeah. time that we assume for noah but okay that doesn't matter we, we can just make up whatever we want if we find some piece of iron doesn't matter where we found it we'll just say that we found it there and we'll just and if it's vaguely shaped like what we want it to be we can just declare that it is the thing that we want it to be but more than that Ron Wyatt is the single most successful archaeologist ever in the history of humanity because he discovered not just Noah's Ark, he discovered the actual cross oh, that Jesus was crucified on. And beneath that cross that wasn't there, obviously there was no cross there. He right. found a hole in the ground and he decided that there was a cross in it. And beneath that hole in the ground, he found a secret chamber wherein he discovered the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> This is the guy, right? He's just got really good luck. <laughs> so he found a box under a hole in the roof, and he he, he then claims that uh, angels met him at the door. He's a regular John Smith, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. So these angels came to accost him. <laughs> And so that we know that at best, this guy is, is is met by two people just show, hey, man, what are you doing? Oh, I'm discovering things. All right. Well, you have a great day, whatever. And so that that becomes this highly controversial in, in, in interaction with these angels. And of course, those angels just went out to get another, you know, another doobie and then completely <laughs> forgot about this. So we, those angels don't even know that they were angels. And, and, and he discovers the Ark of the Covenant, which he cannot remove. For whatever reason, so he had to leave the, the leave the location secret. But the only thing that he was able to get out of this chamber with was the trail of Jesus's blood. The trail itself. Yes, there was a trail of Jesus's blood coming down from the roof, which he it's probably a rust stain, assuming that there's anything there at all, right? So he goes into this chamber in this old Israeli Israeli city, and he finds I don't know a, a 
stain of rust on the wall or whatever, he declares that it's blood. And so he gets a little bit of it. Like he, he said that he scraped it off the wall with a Coca-Cola tab, meaning one of those old fashioned pop tabs that they don't have anymore. Yeah. And he used that to scrape this bit of residual stain off. And then he declared that when he took it home and put it under a microscope, that it came alive. It became living blood cells. God damn it. <laughs> yeah, now we have a team of Israeli scientists who studied this to confirm that it is in fact living human blood and that it has both uh, uh, male and female sex chromosomes so that it could justify how you can have a female parthenogenically give birth to a male. But the data on this that we would all like to see in the scientific story uh, won't be released because the scientist, the team of scientists was unnamed. And it turns out that it's all the research is just, just, it's verified by some Jews that this guy happened to know supposedly. And all of this is actually being done from his, I guess, magnifying glass in his hotel room with his rust stain on his bottle cap. <laughs> it's, it's never, <laughs> it, it is never a good sign when, <laughs> <laughs> when, you're, when, you're, when your research sounds like it's a South Park skit. <laughs> That's a really good song. <laughs> oh, my God. So, so is this guy still, is this guy still, tow well, I mean, I get you said he's, you know, he is in the great beyond now, but w up until his deathbed, he's still touting. You know what great beyond means? It means off. <laughs> <laughs> now he's checking. He's checking. Yeah. Operating system not found. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my God, that is, that is absolutely wild. Oh man, that, that you, you, you do get a couple of guys like that. I'm sure, I'm sure you know plenty about like Mark Armitage and his bison horn that is supposedly a, a ceratop or triceratops horn, ceratopsian horn. I've seen the name of Armitage, but I don't remember the thing about the, that you're talking about now. Yeah. So he, <laughs> I got. I got to. I actually have a, a a buddy who knows the story way better than I do. But he he supposedly has harnessed right uh, genetic material from this from this triceratops horn, which looks suspicious suspiciously in morphology uh, like a like a bison horn. He won't tell where he found it. Um, he's got one photograph of it with with a scale, you know, the scale included. Um, but then in his actual release, his quote unquote press release, he's saying that it's actually much larger than it is, despite the fact that he's included his own scale. And the genetic material that he's claiming to have found has a half-life of like three or four weeks. So this, you know, we got the top brass on this, you know. Um, supposedly he doesn't, he either doesn't have the horn anymore or he's, he's keeping it in a safe location. So, you know, uh, obviously peer review is out of the question. Um, yeah, one of the, the classes I was taking in archaeology, maybe it's the pseudo-archaeology class, I don't remember, but they, they, they gave a rule that whatever you find, if once you, maybe it was paleontology, I can't remember, but, it, but whatever you find, you have to know exactly the location that it was that it was found, because if you take it out of that location and you, and you don't get a GPS reading, which when I was just, when I was just in the Karoo, I found the skull cap while I was walking back to the base camp. And I just like took a, I picked it up and it was just on the sand. There's no other rocks like this anywhere. And, and I said, okay, well, there's, there's, I can't find the other bit of this thing. So I'll just look at this cool thing I found all while I was out there all by myself. Yeah. And so I walked back to the, the base camp with it and they said, oh, this is really great. Where did you find it? Cause and now I need to get an exact reading. <laughs> so I had to lead this team of guys out there so they can get a, 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 a GPS reading of the exact location where I was. But in, in the class lesson, it says if you don't have that, there is no value to your discovery if you can't verify exactly where it was found. I, I entirely, you know, I believe that entirely. I've, I haven't taken any courses on paleontology, but, you know, methodology is so vital. Um, and I would imagine particularly with, with organisms that their location is going to tell you almost everything you need to know about their habitat um, and, and the, you know, kind of their life I, aspects of their life history and, and sort of things like that, things of that nature. Um, but yeah, I mean, and that's, that's the interesting thing too. I mean, you know, methodology is something that I think is dreadfully undertaught in like high school biology and things like that. I, I was certainly wasn't taught proper methodology until post-grad, you know, which is ridiculous. Um, 
because it's so important to understand, you know, why you're getting the data that you're getting um, and and provide the the uh, sort of process so that others can repeat it or have something to compare it to if they make their own finds. Or just verify it. Exactly. Yeah. You, you repeat, verify, you peer review. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> so it, one of the things that, that, that really bothers me about this is, as I said, the, the, all of the arguments that you get for creationism is frauds, falsehoods, and fallacies. That's it. But then for religion in general, you just get lies, lies. That's it. It's not just that, Hey, we have a right to believe this until you prove it wrong, which is already a logical fallacy, which puts it back in the first category I gave. But they do overtly lie. If I were to say, and they 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 will accuse evolutionists mm. of being frauds if they say something is true without being able to show the evidence that it is true. For whatever reason, that makes us liars. If that had ever happened, I'm not saying that it did. Yeah. Yeah. But if that ever happened, that would make us liars. But that's all they do, and that doesn't make them liars somehow. So, so there was a guy today that said that um, the, the people come into his church on, on the COVID-19 thing, if they, if they believe in God while taking communion, they are absolutely immune to COVID-19. Sounds healthy and, and appropriate. <laughs> Yeah, so so is that a lie? Do we have to prove that it's false before we declare that a lie? No, absolutely not. There, you, you it, because the thing is, is that there, there are, I, I, you know, I struggle to use the terminology lie, but I do think it fits. You can't make a claim with nothing to back it up. You know, you can't go out there, particularly in in science, where everybody is watching what you're doing. You have to go out there and say, this is my hypothesis. This is the data that supports it. Here's my, why my interpretation is appropriate. And here's how you can test it for yourself. And you, you can't even say that something is probably true unless you can show that a probability exists. Exactly. And that's why statistics is so vital. You know, I mean, I, I didn't know this until, again, until post-grad, but understanding statistics and, and being able to explain mathematically why your result is, is most probable, even in behavioral studies. I mean, and, and I, I got so irritated about this uh, the other day because, um, you know, you get a lot of comments on, on YouTube videos or, or kind of claims that you make in general on in the internet or blogs, whatever, um, that it genuinely seems to me, and, and I feel comfortable saying that this is the case in most situations, that creationists just think that scientists are other laymen, just kind of giving it the old once over and coming to a conclusion eh, just because it kind of looks that way. You know, and, and that they themselves are presenting brand new, never before thought of observations <laughs> <laughs> due to something that people have been scrutinizing for, you know, 100 plus years. It, it blows my mind. And, and the arrogance is astounding to me. Yeah, but we're accused of arrogance. Mm. We're accused of arrogance for saying that we know something or that they, 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 the believers want everything to be a matter of make believe. So they get to make believe whatever they want, and they think we get to make believe what we want. But we don't get to, we're not allowed to make believe. That would be dishonest. We can't, we can't say the things that the religious believers are saying. We have to be able to back up everything that we say. But what they get really upset at us for is that when we say that we, we do the most evil thing ever, we say that, you no, know, we have evidence that what you're saying is wrong. So we're not letting you make believe what you want. So I had one guy admit to me that he knew, and this was in a written debate mod with moderators, half a dozen moderators, all in the sciences. Right. And he admitted in this moderated debate that he knew that transitional species existed in the fossil record, but that he wanted to teach students that there were none because he said it was important that they believe there are none. And so, like, so you've just admitted that you're going to lie to other people's students to deliberately mislead and deceive them into believing something that, that you want to believe just to support your belief. You don't want them to know what the actual facts are. And you know that that's the actual fact. So you know that what you believe is a lie. And, and the, the thing is, is that that's, that's, that's the most egregious level, bar none, is, is the ones that say, yes, I am aware that I'm wrong. It doesn't matter and we need a new generation to take our place once we're gone so that these ideas can can continue to proliferate. 
you know, I, I had, um, I had a friend again, the same old young earth creationism coworker, um, who by the way, has a degree in biology now, um, which is just great. Um, and is teaching youngsters in middle school. But anyways, we were having a conversation about, uh, um, Noah's flood, right? The Noachian deluge. And I brought up the fact that it's like, all right, you know, what, what creationists want, right. Is, is they need a, a, a supercontinent, either Pangea or Rodinia, if, if you're going with the arc park, depending on which mood they're in, uh, to separate out into all the modern continents in the span of a year. And usually they do like the Walt Brown thing or the catastrophic plate tectonics or rapid subduction or whatever the hell they feel like doing this week. Um, and, and I was like, you know, that combined, like having to speed up that tectonic plate movement into a single year combined with, you know, accelerated radiometric decay, you're going to burn everything up. You're going to boil the oceans. Um, you know, the arc, the arc stability is the least of your problems, uh, but it wouldn't be stable because I don't think metallurgy was in the catalog of, of <laughs> livestock herders. <laughs> years ago. Um, you know, these were very accomplished people. Remember, Noah was a 600-year-old man with, <laughs> yeah, with two, had you know, centenarian sons and, and with just the three of them using Stone Age tools man, managed to build in a single year what it took Ken Ham a hundred million dollars in heavy equipment with hydraulics and electronics and, and, and modern fabrication to build. And not to mention, by the way, that after the flood, their descendants then forgot all of that technology. <laughs> And then went and spread all the hand axes that we have all over the continent of, of Africa and, and the Middle East. Um, so that's that's great. That's all. Awesome. Well, yeah, there's another aspect of that is that they didn't really live in Africa. Yeah, of course, of course not. Yeah, because yeah. because that's not where white people come from. So Adam and Eve couldn't have been there. Right. Noah couldn't have been there. So I get into this argument with this creationist who was a young Earth creationist, and there was there was one of the studies about mitochondrial Eve. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. And and in this study, they have a range of numbers for her uh, for the molecular clock. This was when the concepts of the molecular clock were just being tested out. And and you should take a if you get a, a range of numbers, you're gonna you should pick an average, right? What's the most you know what's what's in the middle? But as uh, you have the oldest state and you have the youngest state, and the youngest state in this case was something like six thousand years. Oh God, no! Yeah. And this was right. This was early on in the mitochondrial you think It was like uh, right when the molecular clock was first being uh, uh, used for the first time. And so this guy says, "Okay, well, this proves that Eve only lived six thousand years ago." And I'm like, uh, "Are you aware that your same study says that Eve is in Africa?" It, right. Exactly. And then suddenly he denies the whole thing. He denies his <laughs> own citation because. Because his family were never in Africa. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 that's the thing. They can they can include as many stock photos with a diverse cast on the Answers in Genesis website as they want. Um, but but we all know <laughs> there's <laughs> many underlying uh, uh, racial issues going on there. Um, with it, actually, I I had a I I don't know that you can call it this. I had a debate with Ken or with Kent Hovind on Modern Day Debate. Um, a you had a debate on modern day debate, really? Yeah, with Kent. Um, I'm going to put a give me a link for that. I'll, I'll I'll put it below. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah but um, I I really wanted him to break because I'd seen his debate with Bill Ludlow, and I remember after Bill, who know, won that debate, by the way, with Bill Ludlow. Yes. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> Bill, Bill Kerb stomped. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've talked to Kent Hovind supporters all the time, and they, and they 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 say just you know, like Kent Hovind would talk about how Dwayne Gish debated all these evolutionists and beat every one of them. I'm like, uh, no, I've seen these debates, and and he he absolutely lost. He embarrassed himself, or would have embarrassed himself if he had such a thing as shame. And also, I've seen a bunch of Kent Hovind's debates. I've never seen one that he's won. I've seen a bunch where he's tried to grandstand, where he's tried to lie, where he, where he tried where he's tried to cover up his own lies, and where he's bullshitted people. But I've never seen him win one. I in in my conversation with him, I actually I don't know. I haven't rewatched it in quite some time. But I had someone say to me that in, at least in our conversation, I don't think he used anything that was non-analogy as a response to me a single time. You know, it's it's cars, it's books, it's let me tell you, Aaron. The fourth time that I asked him why 
uh, it was okay to use a paternity test to tell relations between uh, uh, myself and my mother, but not between species. Uh, he responded with bringing up Stephen King's The Green Mile and proceeding to talk about The Green Mile and how just because evidence looks like it says something doesn't mean that it means that one thing is the case. Um, and I was like, <laughs> It's, no, it's okay. Mine are always coming in and out. I was like, you can't, you can't bring up, you know, the green mile as a response to a question on genetics, first of all. Um, second of all, the only reason why the conclusion was changed in that film's plot was because new information came to light, which is why you can't draw lines in between, you know, the, between the human kind and the other ape kinds. If, if those lines, there's, there's no reason to draw them. You know, I mean, us and, and genus pan share more in common genetically when we're looking at coding base pairs than they do with gorillas or, or pongids. So it doesn't, you know, it, it blows my mind um, just just how he how he manages to, to just obfuscate over and over and over again. I found it very frustrating. But in his- well, I'm going to be completely objective. I haven't seen your debate with Kent Hovind, so I'm not going to declare that you won. I'm just going to say that I know a lot of people that whooped his ass in debates, and I've never seen him win one. So chances are good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I hope, I hope that I did that I did well enough. I mean, I tend to think of them more as discussions. I've I've had discussions with like Standing for Truth, and which I I hope you will discuss with him at some point. He really needs to. Uh, I, there was something that somebody tried to set something up between me and Standing for Standing for Lies at yeah. one point. <laughs> Uh, and I remember he buggered off. Yeah. And I, I, I might have actually talked to him at one point. I, I forget. I, I talked to a bunch of loony bins. Yeah. But, yeah. But. I mean, he was he's he's always been perfectly pleasant with me. I mean, obviously, we we, we disagree very greatly on them. Um, How do you have such a huge disagreement? I I will never understand when wh why somebody would value the make believe. Over the evident reality, I I don't get that. I mean, the, the way I see it, there's two categories of people. Those are the ones that have a desperate need to believe, and that they will lie to themselves, knowing that they are lying to themselves in order to pervert preserve that belief. And then there are the people who want to understand, and that means improving understanding. That means correcting your own errors, acknowledging that you know, that your perspective is not perfect, and that there's got to be errors in it. Finding those errors and correcting them. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, honestly, Aaron, for me, it's come down with a lot of people to, at least in my anecdotal experience, um, a lot of people just really don't want to let go of this idea that they're they're somehow special in, in the animal kingdom, you know, that that humans are somehow this, this great, uh, not animal, of course not, of course not, uh, very removed from everything else, their entire taxonomic kingdom all to themselves. Um, and that they're special and destined for greatness and, and that they can, um, only they are, are worthy of uh, sort of this, this life of eternity. And, you know, as someone who, who studies primates um, and hopefully will continue to do so, oh, God, I just find that so sad. You know, there's so much beauty in, in looking at our, our living relatives and our cousins. And you look, you look at them. I had the pleasure of getting to go to um, Gombe Stream National Park in 2015 uh, and see the chimps there. And you make eye contact with them and there's just, and this is romantic, I'm romanticizing it, of course. And obviously there's no way of knowing what's actually going on in, in their heads. Um, but but you, you just kind of see yourself almost reflected back in, in, in their expressions. And, you know, you see how they interact in primate societies as basal as Liebers have these complex interactions and, and they can be at least, you know, uh, these are kind of human anthropomorphic terms, but for all intents and purposes, they're they're jealous, just like we are, and and they can, you know, hold vengeful ideas. They can be spiteful. They can be altruistic, and and I think people tend to get caught up on this idea that it's like we're applying those terms to them, and less on the idea that maybe ours is just as much of a response stimulus as theirs is, um, and that that our our emotions are almost less complicated than we give them credit for. Um, I, I have to apologize to you. Oh, why? We have been 55 minutes into this conversation, at least, and we haven't talked about your field at all. We were talking <laughs> about my my wheelhouse this whole time. No, right up until now. Yes. <laughs> I, time flies for me. Honest to God, I YouTube is my outlet because if I talk to my family members about this stuff too much, they uh they start getting the blank look and 
<laughs> Let me ask you what what is uh, what what is your accolades so far? I mean, because what, what, somebody in the in the comments section, if I were to call you a scientist, that somebody would say that you're probably not really a scientist because mm -hmm. she never said. Yeah, I, yeah, I wouldn't. I mean, I I would not classify myself. I hope to be a scientist by the end of the uh, by the end of the year. Um, I'm hoping to have a published paper by the end of the year uh, if I can. But essentially, I have my my bachelor my my BSA um, in animal science, and I have a minor in biology, and then another one in anthropology. And I'm currently doing my it's a master's of research. So you you have a bachelor's of science degree already? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've got my my undergraduate degrees knocked out. Um, and I and I'm hoping to go on and do my PhD after after this master's is done, uh, but because it's a master's of research, you know, it requires quite a bit of field work. Um, there's three months of field work that you go out and collect your own data, and then you you drum up your thesis, which mine was supposed to be, you know, sexually dimorphic intervention behavior in in pig-tailed macaques. But the problem is, I can't actually get to Malaysia right now because I was supposed to leave on the 18th. I think I told you in one of my emails, and then the day I was supposed to leave, uh, they were like, hey, no one can come in the country anymore. And I was like, well, okay. And my field site manager was essentially like, well, that's that's fine. You know, the, the, the field site's going to be here. The monkeys are going to be here. Uh, so so in the meantime, I'm thinking, I, I contacted my supervisor, and I'm thinking about trying to maybe eck out a, a, a desk thesis. So I'll have two theses, th two theses, I suppose. Um, and whichever one I like more. <laughs> <laughs> I'll submit. So if I if I like and you know if I like my fieldwork one better, which I don't know, it all depends on how this virus is going to behave on on when I can actually get out there. Because um, my fieldwork experience is rather limited. I did a little undergraduate research with civets in Thailand, um, but it was it was a pretty it was, it was like a month and a half of field research on like diet. Um, so it wasn't too intense. But yeah, I, I I would not graciously consider myself a scientist yet, but I hope to be one by December. <laughs> so this is the thing that I find uh, another stark contrast with the creationists, at that that they will declare themselves scientists on the drop of a hat for any reason at all. I mean, they make up their own PhDs. You know, Kent Hoban made it, you know, got a mail order catalog PhD. Somebody else has a correspondence course for a PhD and so forth. And then we have others that they call themselves creation scientists not the, there's a religious group called creation scientists, but then there's all these other the, the promoting creation science, or no, that's Christian scientists. That that's the religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then you have all these pseudo scientists calling themselves creation scientists, and they're all boasting and blowing themselves up with it. Like Ian Juby is one of my favorite ones. Oh. Yeah, I <laughs> I've had a safari vest in my closet for like 15 years, but I I wore it once. <laughs> Somebody said. Are you trying to look like Ian Juby? Because he wears it as a costume. Yeah, <laughs> and then you were like, you look like he's a paleontologist. And there's this other guy that wears a lab coat, a, a chemistry lab coat. Like, where do chemists wear that lab coat? In the lab, right? Yeah. <laughs> you don't wear it on, on on videos. He's wearing it on video so that he can pretend to be a scientist. They all want to pretend to be scientists so they right. can pretend that they've, you know, that that science actually supports, you know, the religious nonsense. Yeah. So I finally. I, while I was going into the crew, I'm going on a paleontological expedition. Damn it, I am wearing my safari vest. <laughs> Fuck you, even Ian Juby. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the thing. There's something there's something so validating about wearing a, a lab coat in a lab, or like I have a nice wide brim hat that I wore out into the field uh, for the first time. And all my it was funny because once I got out there, uh, all of the other field researchers were like, "You look like you're wearing a field research costume," and I was like. I need an excuse to wear this. Let me have this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can say in my defense, while nobody else had a safari jacket, everybody else was obviously a paleontologist. I mean, you could you, you could look yeah. at the way they were dressed and guess. Yep. With those, with those horrible Wyburn hats. <laughs> <laughs> <They're so laughs> and and uh, it's all cargo pants and cargo shorts, like where there's like a million pockets all through the pants. They usually like, zip off at the knee in case things get a little, little hot and heavy out there, you know? <laughs> yeah, so very clearly all paleontologists, they're all wearing the pale paleontologist costume. They just don't have the safari vest like I do. Yeah, yeah. You had the complete... You ruined it for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're right, though. I mean, that's the thing. It That's why, I, you know, like I brought it up earlier, you know, they, they pulled... Georgia Purdom out to talk about geology over at Answers in Genesis sometimes. And it's like, you know, here I've, I've had the immense pleasure of meeting several excellent scientists um, and researchers. 
And, and if you ask them a question on something that's not in their field, they're the first ones to tell you, that's not my field. Let me direct you to someone who does know more, more about that than I do. On this um, last trip into the crew, I experienced that exact thing. Right. I talked to two people who had never done radiometric dating, and I asked them what kind of dating that they use, and they know the answer to the question. They know that the answer to that question, well, you know, for, for these, we always use uranium lead. But they won't, they're hesitant to give that answer without referring me to somebody else. And right. there were people there who did their own radiometric data so that I could they, they could refer me to somebody that I can just walk over and talk to that guy. Yeah. But you you know it's uranium lead. You could just tell me. You don't have to be an expert to know that. You know that. <laughs> You're the one paying for the study. They give it to you on the receipt. It's uranium lead. <laughs> yeah. And, and they're, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I do this specifically. You're going to want to go talk to the, the radiometric dating guy. He's he's the one, you know. And there is a, there's a there's an intellectual modesty that is that is the reason that we respect academics. Yeah, well, and and that's the thing. I mean, you you spend you spend decades working on like I don't know hominid foot morphology, you know. And then if there's a question about hominid feet, you're gonna go to that person, you know, because they know every single aspect of of what they're studying inside and out. And that's that's kind of the merit of it. that's why experts are experts, you know. That's there, there's a there's a reason they get the title. Um, oh, experts are just people that paid extra money to have letters stapled <laughs> to the end of their name. <laughs> these are the same, and these are the same people who will, you know, go to an ENT if they have like a, you know, a, a problem with congestion instead of a general practice doctor or a pediatrician. You know, it's when they it, should go to their priest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there needs there needs to be a ban on using. Uh, yeah, there needs to be a ban on using modern technology for people who don't accept the merits of conventional science. What yeah. I'd like to see is, and there are laws in the United States to protect religious people from the, 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 the what would be crimes to anybody else. So like when somebody like uh, Kenneth Copeland tries to heal people of coronavirus over the TV. I saw that. Right? I saw that. And, I or when um, and there was another one, uh, Peter Popov right, was having people throw their medications up on the stage because you don't need them anymore. Right. So now this is, this is, uh, Classify it as um, what? What is the crime for pretending to be a doctor? Fraud. You know, yeah, you know, medical advice. Well, if, if you want to call it fraud, I mean, all religion qualifies as fraud. Yeah, like impersonating a doctor, right? Yeah. Well, there's, 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 uh, yeah, there's, there's giving medical advice when you don't have a medical license. That's, I don't remember how they phrase it, but that, there's a crime in that. And then, we, we don't have that applied to faith healers for whatever reason. They somehow get exempt. They can tell the most outrageous lies and they're just exempted from that, even when people die over it. I, I saw something with regard to to COVID-19 actually quite recently, um, Michigan, and I was so it was so nice to be blissfully unaware of this in the UK for six months where I was like, ah, <laughs> things are OK. I mean, of course, Brexit happened, but for the most part, I was like, things are OK here. Um, they're they're better than, than they were because uh, I'm I live in a in a Midwestern state, so I have the the pleasure of all everything that you live in Texas, so you get it all the all the things that go along with that. Um, but yeah, I saw that that the, the government was essentially like I don't know if it's Dr. Fauci or or if it was coming down from the administration, but they were essentially like yeah, no gatherings over X amount of people. This was kind of early on. I don't know if they've since reversed it, uh, but that they included religious organizations, right? Like they were like yeah, you know you can't you know, then you can't be, don't be going to church in in a pandemic. It's not a good idea. And then Michigan comes around, classic Michigan, and they're like hey, actually uh, churches are exempt from that, so you guys can go ahead and have your meetups. And, um, and I'm like, that's, you know, if you want to endanger your life, that's all fine and dandy, but that impacts everyone around you. Um, it's, it's kind of like the same logic as like anti-vax, right? Um, yeah. it's like your decision impacts others and that that's not okay. The second that that starts encroaching on everyone else, um, is, is the second that people, someone needs to step in and say, okay, no, you, you can't be up to that. Um, and for some reason we're still having this problem. I, I can't put my finger on it. <laughs> I I, res I have to uh, admit that you know the freedom to believe whatever you believe for whatever reason you believe it to to have and hold your private thoughts to be to and and not be criminalized for what you believe not be penalized in any sense for that because you you have a right to that that's that's free thought 
Free thought is literally the most basic freedom humanity can have. And that's the thing that religion goes after because it's a belief system. They don't want you to think freely. They will criminalize you, penalize you, kill you if you don't believe what you're told to believe simply because you're told to believe it. So that's a violation of the most basic human rights is religion. At the same time, while I would advocate that everybody has the right to believe what they want and they don't have to defend or justify or explain it to anybody, you don't get, you shouldn't get the privilege that comes with it. And that's the problem. That's why I think that the, the courts made a mistake when they allowed that got the, when they allowed the, um, what, what do they call it? The guys that worship the flying spaghetti monster, the Pastafarian. Yeah, right. Yeah, Perfect. when they allowed the Pastafarian to get his driver's license picture with the colander on his head. <laughs> I the, hadn't heard about that. That's that's a that's funny as a meme, and then you're like, "Ooh, how does this actually impact the way society?" <laughs> because that's the precedent that allows the people to get their driver's license pictures with burkas on. Yeah, yeah. So there's no way to identify the person in the identifying photo. Well, yeah, and, and that's the thing. I mean, freedom, the freedom to believe what you want. I, I'm with you on that. I mean, I think that that individuals should feel free to to uh, think and, and worship how they please in the United States. But that goes again, that goes so far as to as as in its infringement on other people. Um, and the second that that infringes on people's ability to do their jobs, uh, like, for instance, pol you know, police officers with you know, identifying people um, or or their their loved ones and teaching things like uh, like creationism in schools, which is incredible that that lasted as long as it did. Um, but, so yeah, you, you know, that's it, it becomes dangerous. Religious organizations have all kinds of loopholes for the laws that would apply to anybody else that nobody else gets away with, but religious people get away with. And so that that's, we're not coming for your beliefs. We are coming for your privilege. That was a slogan for a, an atheist activist group that I, that I right. saw recently. And that's that. what I'm all about. I don't understand, I don't say why, uh, okay, you should not only be taxed. The religion should not only be taxed, they should be fined. I, I would go, I would go much further because if you're, because what is fraud? Let's look up the definition of fraud. Hey, that applies to religion. You're right. lying to people. You're bilking them out of your money. And it, and when we say lies, again, we're not talking about things that even have a possibility to be true. We're talking about overt statements of fact based on nothing that are demonstrably not true. Like you are going to be immune to COVID virus if you believe and take communion in our church. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and that's, that's exactly what ends up taking people's lives when they, you know, you have 80 year old grandma thinking that she's got this, this special protection going out and buying her groceries and getting exposed. You know, it's, it's, it's not, uh, I, I gotta agree with you on that. It's, it's not, it's not fair to all of us who are out here and, <laughs> uh, and law abiding, so to speak. I have to apologize to you again, because 15 minutes ago, I, I told you that we'd only been talking about my wheelhouse. We hadn't been talking about primatology <laughs> at all. <laughs> You know, no, I, again, I can't, I cannot emphasize this enough. I really just wanted to come on and, and kind of uh, pick your brain and, and shout about it in general. I mean, I, as far as like things to talk about in particular, I mean, I can, again, don't get me wrong. I can talk about primates and human evolution all day, but I've, I've had a blast anyways. Well, thank you for that. Uh, uh, we were talking about going for like 20 minutes to an hour, as long as it kept interesting. And I think it kept interesting. Oh, absolutely. But we're now well over an hour. Oh, yeah, I don't want to take up too much of your time. <laughs> <laughs> but this was fun. Um, and uh, as far as the definition about whether you're a scientist, I, I always call myself a science communicator. I, I think that's a yes. fair description. Yes. Uh, and one of the definitions that I gave that I think you could fairly call yourself a scientist when you have a science degree. But the, the, the real trick is whether you're doing science and right. that requires that you're submitting the peer reviewed literature. So when you have the articles submitted for peer review, then you can fairly call it. Then you can definitely call yourself a scientist. And we're getting close. And I'm, I'm really, I really can't wait for that. It's, it's, you know, it's daunting. Peer review is daunting, but at the same time, you know, that's, it's, it's being a part of, of uh, the catalog of knowledge, so to speak, you know, you're adding to it and, and putting your stuff out there and saying, Hey, listen, you know, this is what I got. This is my contribution. Um, even if, even if it's for something as, as, as sort of small as primate social systems, which I think is very interesting. Which is actually very important. 
right? I think it is. Uh, but you know, the, <laughs> everyone loves their study species. You get, you get a, you get like a, one of my professors had, had studied quite a bit on banded mongooses and you get him, you get him going on banded mongooses and suddenly they're the most important species <laughs> <laughs> known in every ecosystem. <laughs> Okay, uh, and in the in the trip I was just on, of course, they're all you know, uh, therakophalians. That's uh, it. <laughs> those are the most important. The Permian is the time to be. It and I, I I favor that. I, I'm very fond of the Permian myself. Yeah. Because of the the thing that I think uh, is fascinating about that is that you have this complete ecosystem which virtually nobody knows about. Right. You know, it's only professional scientists really and, and extreme nerds who like even know that this period even existed. Right. So we're talking about a time before there were dinosaurs for the audience again, uh, in which you have the equivalent of a bison, deer, gophers, uh, wolves, uh, and and other sort of animals that we're familiar with now, but they are not remotely those same animals. They're extremely different. Like imagine a turtle with no shell but has a beak but also tusks. Figure that out. And it <laughs> And it's the size of a cow. <laughs> you were looking at some of those uh, dinocephalids. Dinocephalids. Yeah. Well, I was told that my pronunciation of that was incorrect. Oh, oh you always got you always got to go to the. To, what do they say? Well, they say dinocephalians. It's not it's not dinocephalians. It's dinocephalians. Dinocephalians. I got I got. There was a lecture that I got the first day that I was there. Yeah. <laughs> oh no <laughs> i'm sure that went over well <laughs> <laughs> i got i got i got nine experts with all you know all their names are professor blankety blank phd yeah i'm, I'm gonna shut up <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that that's yeah once you get in the room with someone with that many doctorates that's when you back down you, you're like listen <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i, I got it on my pronunciation for uh i i've said it dunkley osteus for belong as long as i can remember though the placoderm but it's a uh, dunkel osteus and i or maybe dunkel osteus and and i i read that and i was like well, why is it dunkel osteus and they're like well the guy who found it in the last name dunkel and i was like damn they're right <laughs> <laughs> kind of hard to argue that one <laughs> i know i was like <laughs> i always called it diplodocus i had a girlfriend who called it diplodocus Oh, <laughs> we we just won't talk about that. Yeah. That's, that's when you're like, look, that's a fight that's not worth having. <laughs> yeah, that's I I because I talk so much about uh, hominids and hominins. Those ones I usually do pretty well on. Um, but I I always I never have the heart to tell anyone when they're like, it, do, so do you think it's Neanderthalensis or Neanderthalensis? And I'm always like, well, I, I've heard it both ways. And it's like, yeah, but my professor always said. Tallensis, so that's what I go with, you know. And they're pretty strong about that. They it, are. They yeah, really. That H, that, that H is not pronounced. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> and if you say it in front of them, the first time I said it, uh, my my human evolution professor was uh, Peter Unger, so he's big on tooth tooth microware for uh, the paranthropines and uh, some of the osteopaths. And he uh, he actually has a book called Evolution's Bite. If you want to check it out, it's I think it's pretty good. So we're uh, talking about the, the the way that they determined that the paranthropines were eating like roots and tubers and C four plants. Right. So so they they look at the teeth, the molars underneath the microscope, and they look for shearing patterns or pitting or things like that uh, to try and determine and and you know alongside of course the the flora of the time and try to determine kind of what what the what the uh, dietary patterns were. Um, and that's kind of like his whole his whole wheelhouse. And you know, he when he was going over, you know, late from the Homo and he was talking about Neanderthalensis, he said, and you know, last but not least, you know, Homo Neanderthalensis. And he looks at everyone and he goes, oh. and then they just like they're not a thing and be like, okay, no one asked. No one said <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, Erica, this was this has been fun. Uh, do please uh, share with me a link that I can put down below. Absolutely. Uh, and, and as soon as I have that, I'll make this. Um, I'll make it available here. Yeah, we'll uh, do. And we'll we'll try to talk again. I'm I'm interested in seeing your your debate with uh, with Hovind. <laughs> hey, and, we can, we can talk about that all day long. I have a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at another time, very soon. Uh, after I get a chance to see it, or sure. maybe maybe 
maybe I'll talk to you before then. I don't know. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I'm usually quick with email. So any, any okay. time is good. I'm quarantined like the rest of the country. So I've got all this free time. I don't know what to do with. <laughs> yeah. I was supposed to be super crazy busy right now. I, I saw your video on that and, and I was like, man, not to the same extent, but I was like, same, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I don't know what to do with all this time. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it's a funny thing that it, it actually worked out for me that all the all of these trips and everything got canceled because my B semester started two weeks ago. Right. And if I was on a cruise ship, yeah, snor snorkeling in the Bahamas, <laughs> when the hell would I have done all of these reports? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's so I'm, I'm sitting in the I'm sitting at my house feverishly working on my class projects, realizing that. <laughs> I was supposed to be in Jamaica right now. <laughs> <laughs> you you see that the wisp flies in front of you and you just wave as it as it disappears. <laughs> I, I can't dwell on it too much because it, it bumps me out. I'm always like I could be with the monkeys right now, but instead I'm I'm wrangling my dogs who can't stop, you know, eating and then vomiting up socks that they find around the house, which isn't the kind of science I thought I'd be doing this semester. What what part of the country are you in? Uh, Midwest. Really? So I'm in Indiana. Yeah, unfortunately. What, more specifically? Yeah, uh, Southern Indiana. So, Ooh. yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My condolences. <laughs> I know. <laughs> when I look at a map, when I look at a map of the United States, and I look at all the places that I've that I've spoken, uh, or that I've been to at least, I, I mean, I, it, it's like ev I've been to every state. Uh, you know, there's a, there's four or five northeast states like Maine and such that I that I have you know, Vermont, New yeah, Hampshire. Yeah. I haven't been up there, but I've been to every other state with this glowing exception of Indiana. <laughs> listen, listen. <laughs> our state motto is the crossroads of America because Indiana is the state that people use to get to other states. So I do <laughs> not take it personally. <laughs> We don't have much going on. Indianapolis is okay. I mean, it's 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 fine. But I mean, you could do Indianapolis in Chicago, and it's just better. So it's like I don't know why you wouldn't just go there. It's also in an I state, so you get that bonus too. <laughs> it's the you know we we have a great we have a great meth representation here in Southern Indiana as well. So that's yeah, and I, and, I, and I think the the one of the best things Indiana can brag about is that you guys produce Mike Pence. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me put it this way. I live, this is probably me doxing myself a bit for right now, but I, between you and me, I actually live in Mike Pence's hometown. And when I, I live in Columbus. So when you pull in, there's this big sign that says home of vice president, Michael Pence. And I see that and my, my blood pressure just skyrockets every time I, I'm, I'm 24 and I'm getting, you know, like hypertension because I pass by that sign so frequently. It's it's awful. <laughs> hmm. But you know, whatever. It's and and of course I I've, I've come here my uh my my partner and I moved here um he's actually staying with us now cuz we're both in quarantine cuz we were on a flight less than or actually about a week ago now. Um and they actually had to medically evacuate this dude on the flight cuz he he was feeling ill and we were like cool we probably you know we're we're both coming off of an illness so whether it was covid or not I don't know. Uh, but here we've come from living in in South London, you know, a hub of the world where I've got a, a, a 20 minute tube right to the Natural History Museum of London, where they have Darwin's pigeons in their treasury collection, Wallace's butterflies, and the first Archaeopteryx lithographica fossil right there. Free as, well, as well as Mary Anning's work. And yeah, all of Mary Anning's stuff. They've got um, they've got a, a, a cave. And one of the people that was on my team in South Africa is the curator at the NHM. Really? Yeah, for non-mammalian tetrapods. Oh my god, they they actually have a they have such an impeccable collection there. So that's it, that is my favorite building in the world. They're just just the building itself before you even get into it. Just walking up to it is is an amazing edifice. It's imp it's imposing, it's gorgeous, and then of course, right when you walk into that main entrance, you got and really both entrances are cool because one you got a great view of the stegosaur, and then that sort of uh, elevator up into the geology section. But then the other one, you've got this blue whale hanging over everything, and there's just like treasuries all along. Oh, it's incredible! I went there five times for the six months I was there. It was great. When I first went, they still had Dippy. Oh, I know he's on tour now. I think they're they're touring <laughs> around the the country. 
Yeah, and I, I, I would wish that they would put it back because that's like that's the classic NHM. Is it supposed to have that? But one of the things that, that 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 building has is you know when we looked closely at the bricks that make up the interior walls, they have sculptures in them. So there would be like monkeys and stuff sculpted into the bricks of the walls. I, the I know the ones you're talking about. They're gorgeous. And then the stairway itself, when you stand in the right place, you begin to feel like you're in an Escher painting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you've got big Daddy Darwin sitting up on his on his pedestal overlooking everything, and I believe uh, um, uh, Huxley is up on the second floor over by the geology section. Their human evolution exhibit is excellent. The dinosaurs are impeccable. They've got this big Gallimimus, um, the the two arms that are like looming overhead that just gives you an idea of the scale. I, I will say the Chicago Fields Museum is also excellent, but also they've got that uh, it's a uh, Patago Titan. Um, which is like, it's like the biggest land animal that ever lived, or maybe it's the Argentina one is bigger. I'm I always sure. thought that it was our uh, Argentina source, but. I think you might be right, but Patagotain is still pretty big. Yeah. And, you know, it's looming there. And, and I found that very cool as well. So it's like, and plus I've been to the Field Museum many times, so it's got a special place in my heart. But of course here in, in Columbus, we don't have any museums. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> okay, I, I went to, um... I went went to the NHM and and with a friend of mine and we we got a picture of he and I uh, on our knees genuflecting before Daddy Darwin statue, <laughs> 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 just to give the creation of something that they yeah. thought that we do. <laughs> I I actually took a picture with him as well and I I made my uh, I made my boyfriend take the picture and he he takes it and he goes you look so sheepish like taking this picture and I was like I'm embarrassed like I don't want him to look down on me. Like, <laughs> I'm in the shadow of an expert. He's like, he's a sculpture. He's yeah, you know, he wasn't that big in real life, right? Yeah, he's like a short, yeah, I know. And I was just like, I'm standing here and I'm like, oh God. And what I like is on the other side of the building, they have they have Huxley, as you said. Right. And, and what's he immediately facing? They have a white sculpture of Huxley and he's standing beneath and facing a black sculpture of Sir Richard Owen. So yeah. if, you know, if you know anything about Huxley and Owen. They did, you know, mm, yeah. You, you, and you put them facing each other, where 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 um, Owen is looking very Dracula like, very intimidating with his arms out like this, and then you've got Huxley who's just calmly like this, and it just you you've locked these guys for an eternity. <laughs> their their souls facing their mortal enemy. <laughs> you you know too the the curator at the time was like, man, this is going to be so funny, you know and. <laughs> So yeah. and, and it is, and you can you can appreciate it. it I, I actually noticed that as well as also they kind of you know of course they give as perhaps they should they give Owen like the uh, the looming dark color of like being incorrect, and then you've got you know Huxley like you said he's 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 almost just in con a calm contemplation. Um, I I I love it. That that building really is just impeccable. They they had. Um, they had this really interesting exhibit that they that was there while I was there that they then took down the last time I was there for the um, uh, the moon. So they take this big uh, model of the of the moon and kind of project all the all of the topography onto it. And I could sit in that room all day. You know, it's 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 beautiful to just look at it kind of above you right that and right there. And then you leave and you're like, well, shit, now I've got the rest of the museum that I got to see, too. You know, it's like I spent half my time in the human evolution segment and then half my time in the moon exhibit. And um and I got to cram the dinosaurs and geology into the hour and a half before it closes and then miss out on, on everything else. Um, it's, it's awesome. I, I had a friend actually who works in the Darwin center there, which I think she works with the arthropods. I'm not sure, but I love that building. It's, it really is excellent. I, wanna, I think it's the best museum in the world. All right. Well, Erica, I normally don't talk this long with anybody and I have to, I have to impose I'm it. Flattered, though. <laughs> <laughs> that, that means you had a good time. <laughs> It, it is nice to to meet to meet somebody with you know shared interests and shared a uh, shared understanding and on sadly I'm gonna apologize one last time for the same thing I I'm sure because I've only taken like a class in in primatology and your field is primatology that you could you could teach me quite a lot I'm sure and we will have that conversation another time we will have another conversation because I want to I want to get another video where I have you talking about your debate with Hovind. Oh, I would, I would love to. I um, think I should watch it before I hear you, you talk about it. So we'll, we'll, we'll send yeah. it. We'll, I, I'll, I'll shoot it. I'll shoot you. Shoot it to you in the email. I, uh, not to, to, to brag, but it's, it's 
done, it did pretty well on Modern Data Bait. I think it has like 20K views now. So it's it's pretty easy to find. It's my face. I've got laser shooting out of my eyes. It's James is pretty good with those thumbnails. <laughs> I got I, I respect the guys that do Modern Data Bait. Uh, but you know, the, the funny thing is, is that I know that it's hosted by a believer. Yeah. And after you've been doing this for a while, I'm like, how long is that going to last? I mean, <laughs> I, I actually, I saw someone asked him one time, actually in um in one of the super chats, I think, and they asked James specifically. They were like, "Have has any of your have any of your opinions changed like over the course?" And he kind of got very very bashful, almost his face turned really red, and he's like, "Yeah, you know, I I, I try to keep this as nonpartisan as possible, but um, but." I, you know, I'm obviously imposing my thoughts on it, but I, I, I feel like he probably has. He's, he's had a lot of interesting characters on there, and uh, not very many of them make, um, <laughs> except maybe Sigart make, make the other side look that great, though. Yeah, you know, Sigart is advantageous in that you know he, he, he he's on our side of yeah, the awesome. creation issue, so that's brilliant. And and it, well, I somebody had set up a, a discussion between me and him, and he and I agreed on every all, all the scientific aspects brilliantly and so we yeah. didn't have a run in at all yeah, uh, he's 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 done some excellent work too i think and it's sort of in his own field as well um and and that's the thing i mean it's like what 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 people what opinions they have outside of the science that they do is is fun to talk about and and important in its own way but in its realm with relation to doing good science you know but when we're talking about creationists we're not talking about just opinions we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about lies Creation, no, creationism no can't, does not count. <laughs> there's not a textbook ever that said that we came from, that, that that evolution teaches we came from rocks. Evolution does not teach that. No textbook ever said that. No evolutionist ever said that. That is a lie, Kent. You need to correct your lie. He he won't do it though. Now it's a it's a, it's on principle now. I <laughs> it, plus dinosaur adventure land has gotten some has taken some heat recently. Did you did you see what? Yeah, what? there was a child that drowned. Yeah, I, I and saw he, that. He well. actually said, "Mr. Narcissist," actually said, but the rest of the family had a great time. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the one down. So it was a great afternoon, really, apart from little Timmy drowning. Oh my God. That is appalling. Oh, you can, yeah, you can, you can kind of see him. You, you can really see it though. I mean, really, anything that has to do with the water, you can really picture Kent. <laughs> you can really I see you reacting to his speech yeah. in a couple of times. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eric. Uh, All right. Eric, we will we will we'll book another conversation. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I, I I think probably soon. Absolutely. But I'm yeah. going to have to close this one out. Yeah, thank sure. you very much for for inviting me, and it was a fun conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I I had a blast.